Hi, good morning again. Uh, Kelly Tucker from section 4135 just let me know that the video that I recorded and uh, in which I tried to demo the uh, how to work through lab one wasn't really uh, very useful because it didn't have the actual uh, screen content of lab one. So I apologize for that. I'm going to be recording this to show off the Pearson My Lab features so that uh, as you work through Lab 1, you use it as experiential hands-on learning uh, to go along with the content. So I'm actually going to redo the lecture component and then the lab demonstration. So here goes. First, I'm going to share screen. And I'm going to go to the whiteboard. And again, uh, this uh, board is about chapter one. Chapter one is about the notion of data and variations. And what uh, we discussed in the video that is not complete, and by the way, Kelly, congrats, you're gonna get some extra credit. Uh, the, um, format for the course is that we're focused on using data in order to run data through concepts in this class, tools, methods, and models that create the possibility and the opportunity for developing what we call statistics. So data and statistics, we said, were two very different things. A statistic is essentially a numerical adjective. And as we all know, adjectives are useful in providing insights about something. So in this case, data will be what the adjectives are modifying, what the adjectives are describing. So what is data? Well, that is the subject matter of chapter one. What is data? And as your book tells you in chapter one, it's actually what are data? So data is a plural. That is not a singular data. And the shortest definition of data is that data is information. But it's not just information. It's information that we add a purpose to. It's information with a purpose. It's information with a structure. And it's information with a context. That's what data are. Okay. Uh, purpose leads to uh, us being able to answer a question about data. That question is why? Why do we need this information? Structure is a little bit more complex because for data to have a structure, uh, this structure must be something that is visually, um, uh, that visually facilitates our understanding of the knowledge in question. And so in this case, we're gonna have uh, what? We're gonna be answering a question about what? And we're also gonna be answering a question about who? And the who are gonna provide us with visuals in the form of rows. The who of the data are the different cases or observations that we form. 
And these cases may take on very different kinds of formats. It could be um, responses to a survey. They could be uh, observations of innate, inert, or even living objects. Uh, they could be um, identities. They could be people. They could be companies. It could be a lot of different things, a whole host of different things. Whereas the what in the data are going to provide us a structure by columns where every column is a different element of the data. And these elements can be thought of as by the name variables. And we usually call them variables because they vary. They uh, don't take on constant values. So as such, uh, these columns of uh, variables, and each variable is its own uh, particular aspect of the data. And there are two kinds of uh, variables, two kinds of columns. One kind of column is going to be called categorical. And the other kind of column is going to be called quantitative. So we have categorical variables. We also have quantitative variables. What distinguishes categorical from quantitative variables is that um, categorical types of variables describe kinds or types of information whereas quantitative data describes amounts. And as such, they have different um, uh, mathematical structures, different mathematical formats. Um, after all, this course is titled uh, Business Statistics. It's a course that satisfies uh, your prerequisite in quantitative reasoning. In your general education, okay? And quantitative reasoning means uh, thinking with numbers. But what kind of numbers are we talking about thinking? Uh, well, it's numerical adjectives statistics. And the statistics are going to uh, come from this, uh, these structures, these data tables that tell us what and who the data are about. Okay. So our concepts, tools, methods, and models are concentrated in this particular arrow here, in the, surrounded by the yellow square. We're going to take data and we're going to create adjectives from the data. Last but not least, in terms of structures, we also have a third add-on set of features about the context of data. And the context of data is expressed in the form of questions like where or space and when or and space and time give context to these kinds of tables of data such that all in all data can be described in two different uh, ways. There are two kinds of data. One kind of data uh, will be called a time series. And that's when the rows are organized by chronological time that is periodically set up. So those are called time series. And then there are cross sections of data. Cross sections are when identity or space are behind the 
focal point of each row. Uh, and this table here, in this particular uh, board here, board number two here, is um, I think a really good picture, a really good visual of what the of what chapter one is about. It's about introducing the notion of data, defining data carefully through the so-called five W's of data. What are the five W's of data? There's why, there's who, there's what, there's where, and there's when. The five W's. Uh, now, uh, let's move into Canvas and share a screen on Canvas that would uh, show us how to use Pierce in my lab through Canvas. So I'm going to be opening a shared screen. Currently, uh, my, my browser is set to my YouTube channel. I'll be posting soon a YouTube channel identifier with all the videos that are public in my YouTube channel. I see that some videos like uh, getting started with the class is 70 views. So that's pretty cool. And uh, soon uh, I will be posting this Lab One demo video that has 39 views. Uh, I'm going to be uh, sharing with you how to use StatCrunch one more time. Uh, I'm going to first go to Canvas and pick the dashboard for one of the two sections of summer. I'm opening section 2112. And I'm going to my lab and mastering. And within my lab and mastering, um, as I click on that, it'll take a few seconds because what uh, Canvas is currently doing is it's going outside of our DVC system and it's linking to uh, your textbook publisher. And I'm going to click on this yellow button that says open my lab and mastering. And uh, upon opening my lab and mastering, I'm going to go to the assignments page where I can look at all the assignments and uh, notice how June 26 is when our first module should be completed uh, sometime in the first two weeks of class. So in the first two weeks of class, we're, we should be done with at least three chapters and actually close to four chapters and close to two exams um, of content. The deadlines are a little bit forward looking to allow for any delays in your progress. So they're already extended deadlines, so to speak. When you open a lab, what you will see is the layout of questions and how many points each question is worth. I'm entering question two. And question two has two parts remaining besides the one showing. Question two has a context, a case study context, and a data table. So notice how this data table represents rows of who and columns of what. And the purpose of this data set is it's a local bookstore keeping a database of its customers to find out more about their spending habits. So that's the why, that's the reason why. And it doesn't really say where or when these data were collected. Interestingly, the where and the when don't have to be present for this to be considered data. So why, who, and what are necessary for you to have information be called data? information has to have a reason to be and it has to have an identity and components called variables that those three factors are necessary conditions for data knowing where and when are sufficient conditions meaning it's cool if we know them not necessary if we don't have them so here we have the first five lines of this database which is probably more voluminous and the first column is called a transaction ID. And it has a sequence of numbers that aren't really an amount. 
They're not an amount. They are an identifier. So in a way, they're categorical. They're identifying transactions that the company has been working on. Notice how the second column is a customer identifier, and some customers buy more than one item or have more than one transaction even in the same date. And so these customers are buying different things the same day, and therefore each row is a different transaction. Now, if you get the wrong answer, check it. It'll tell you that it's incorrect and to carefully review the table to know what each, uh, what the who of the data are in this case. And each row represents a different transaction. So the lab allows you to have up to three tries at a part of a question and gives you immediate feedback to answer the question. Once you answer a part correctly, it tells you how many more parts are remaining and you can continue and complete those parts. As you complete those parts, notice that the software will tell you how much of the question remains in order for you to get complete credit for all the values in the item there. Then it, here it says, how would you best describe the role of the variable transaction? And transaction is a case because it's not an experiment. It's not a repsident, but I think it's a typo. I think it, they meant to say respondent. Uh, it's not that anybody answered a survey to create this database. This database was created by the company to track transactions. And so every row of data is a different case. And that's the most accurate way of describing each row. Again, if I miss, I'll have two more shots at getting this answer right before moving to the third aspect of the question. And the third aspect of the question is asking how many variables are measured in each row. And every column is a what? Every column is a variable. And there are eight columns in all. Some variables are categorical. Some variables are quantitative. Most variables are categorical. Only price is quantitative. All the others are identifiers or dates. And so here, if I put a number anything other than eight, I'm going to get the answer wrong. Until I put eight, do I get the answer right? Because there were eight columns. Then I can proceed to the next question. And at this point, if I have to do something else with my life, if I have to go to work or if I have to go take care of something around my home, what I would do is I would close and leave the site. Okay, now, I now recognize what Nikki was saying, that I wasn't really showing all these components as I was working through them. That's because I hadn't shared them with you. So I'm gonna share with you question three. So I'm going to open question three first. And once I open it, I'm going to go and open in share mode. And I'm going to share with you the homework screen. So once again, this is a problem. It's worth two points. It's question three of nine. And uh, I have some question help features, like for example, a video that I can watch, which is the chapter video. The chapter video can also be found in the peers and chapter contents tool here. In the chapter contents tool, chapter one. And there's the video for the chapter. Okay. So I'll be posting announcements like, hey, you should go watch the video on chapter one from Pearson. And essentially every chapter comes with a video presentation of the chapter so that you don't have to necessarily read it like a book, like you would read a, a novel um, on print. Okay, going back to the main menu window, going back to the main menu window, going back to assignments, clicking back on lab one, opening a question. That question opens in a new window. And now I need to share that window with you so that you could see the structure of every lab question.
Thank you, Kelly. So um, in this case, I have a real estate major that collected information on some home sales. The home sales are in this table here that's clickable. So notice how the table has columns that tell you what are the data, and it has rows. And every row tells you who the data are about. And in this case, this data set is about the first six lines of a table where the first column tells us that we're looking at different houses. So each row should be a different house. Okay, and the house identifier is, let's say that it's a quantitative variable because it looks like a number, I might be confused into thinking that this is a quantitative variable. And when I check the answer, the answer tells me it's wrong. Now, because of the red color, you're immediately sort of feeling like you should close this box and try again. Try to resist that temptation. Actually read the comment as to why your answer is not correct before you try another response. So notice that for each variable, we are describing it as if it's categorical or quantitative. A house ID is an identifier variable. And the only type of variable that is identifier variables basically just identify things. They basically create a name that is very unique and specific to one item. Nominal refers to the uh, a quality of data where instead of measuring amount, you're basically labeling something with a name. So nominal comes from the word name and categorical are variables that are about type or kind. So a house ID is describing a specific home in a specific neighborhood with a specific zip code of a specific size of property with a specific home year built and with a specific market value and with a specific square footage of living area per the descriptors on this table. So I'm gonna try A to check my answer and A is the right answer. Once you get the right answer, you can move on to the next answer. What is the variable neighborhood? Neighborhood again is a type of category and it is nominal because it's the name of a neighborhood. It's not ordinal. Ordinal comes from the meaning of order, something having order. Like for example, um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, something like that, that has an order or a ranking, like a restaurant ranking on Yelp. A four-star restaurant is considered better than a two-star restaurant, etc. So if I, again, make a mistake, I should read what the mistake may be so that I can try a second time. And if I make a mistake a second time, I should read again because until I have a third chance to get the right answer. So during the lab, problems may have more than one component or more than one part and each part is standalone and you get feedback as you work through the lab case studies. And the purpose for that is for you to learn the content, the concepts, the tools, the methods, and the models that we're gonna be covering in every chapter and that you do so with more than one try. So when we were talking about grit at the beginning of the class in Canvas, grit is something you develop by trying and failing and trying and failing until you try and succeed. That's where grid comes into play in becoming a more refined, a better, a more excellent quantitative thinker. And so the way the lab encourages that is by providing you with three opportunities per part of a question. Until you eventually master the concepts of chapter one and you may not need more than one shot at getting every answer correctly. And if you get all three tries wrong and you don't get a full two points from doing a particular problem, 
the lab then gives you two more extra tries at the whole question. So not only do you get three shots per part, but you get three shots per problem for a total of nine shots. And that's what I mean by providing you with what grit is the root that enables you to become a uh, better thinker and a better, um, you know, a more, uh, acquire the mastery of the terminology from chapter one that you're going to need in chapters two through 14 of this course this summer. Okay. Now, if I receive a phone call right now and I need to go, I can close this question. Even if I'm not completely done with the question, I could just leave the question. And as I leave the question, I can then come back to it whenever I have time to keep working on the content. And you shouldn't try to do too much. You should try to work 15 to 20 to 30 minutes per sitting and then shut it down and go do something else uh, or uh, go take a break. It's not very healthy to stay on the system for prolonged periods of time and be on the screen for more than 45 minutes. Again, thank you, Kelly, for letting me know that I had messed up the earlier video and extra credit for you, real extra credit, real points. <laughs>